up here on the screen behind me, you guys can see, and for those of you at home, you can be looking at the screen. I want to go back and pick up something and expand upon it a little more in depth, just so we understand that we actually have some duties to third party people. All right. They are called non fiduciary duties. These non fiduciary duties are duties that are in addition to what we already have called fiduciary obligations under the law of agency. All right. Now, they are not specifically unique to just agents like us. You can have non fiduciary employee obligations to their company, but they still fall under the same kind of obligation. So let me explain, and you'll get what I'm saying here. <clears throat> A non fiduciary duty, meaning you owe this to everybody, not just your fiduciary obligations like your client. So you would owe non fiduciary obligations to someone with whom you have no agency, i.e. customer. So what I'm talking about basically is these are the obligations you owe to customers. They are called non-fiduciary. I don't have a fiduciary relationship with them, but I still have the duty of skill and care. I still can't be a shitty agent, even to a customer. I've got to be honest and fair got to be forthright i have the duty of information or cooperation i have to give actual information to a, a customer if it is relevant to the transaction all right i can't lie to them and the example that i give and i have used for years is when Someone calls the brokerage and you pick up the phone and they go, hey, I saw the sign in the house at 12 Smith Street. Is it for sale? We have, even though there's no fiduciary obligation between us and that person on the phone, you still have non-fiduciary obligations. You still have the duty of skill and care. You still have the duty of cooperation and information. You could say, yes, that property is for sale. That's customer level service. Is it a four bedroom? No, it's three bedroom. That's customer level service. Now, if they start asking questions like, can that property be bought for less than that? Because I think that's overpriced. Now is when you do not want to say anything else because you're going to cross that line into giving them insight and advice. And that is going to create implied agency. That's not what we're talking about this minute. We're on these non-fiduciary. So you still have those obligations to be honest, exercise reasonable skill and care, don't be sloppy, the duty of to give information, all right? So we have our code of ethics, which still says that we have to act with honest, integrity, fair business dealings, skill and care, proper disclosure of known facts, uh, you cannot and could be liable for fraud, negligent misrepresentation, or knowingly conducting yourself in a business manner that is adverse to the code of ethics. Okay? So, avoiding misrepresentations during the disclosure period. Misrepresentation is a false statement or a non disclosure. Understand what I just said. <clears throat> you can lie, and that's wrong. But there is this thing called lying by omission. Lying by omission, and that's what we're talking about. The non disclosure of a material fact with the intention of misleading a buyer is lying by omission. That is actually misrepresentation and could be fraud. So when someone says, is there a hole in the roof? And you say no, and you know there is, that would be construed as fraud because you flat out lied. 
if somebody says, well, I know that the roof's cracked. I'm sorry, <laughs> the roof's cracked. I know the foundation's cracked. And you go, yes, that's correct. And they say, is there anything else I should know? And you say, no, that is lying by omission. You failed to disclose a piece of information that should have been, that is lying by omission. That could also be fraud. So there are three types of misrepresentation. The one we just talked about, where it's out and out intentionally fraudulent, you misrepresent or intentionally mislead the party to induce them to enter into a contract. Now, when that happens, there are nine elements that must occur. So for you to be accused of fraud, the uh, there has to actually be say that the, there was a representation that was made by you, whether it's positive or negative. What I mean by that is whether you flat out lied or you lied by omission. They have to determine that that representation that you made was false and that it was material to this deal. That would be important, obviously. That you made this representation knowing it was false or, in fact, did not know it to be true. Once again, this is the inverse or the negative of that. You can't say, dude, buy this house right here. Walmart's going to move in over there and make this commercial property worth more. You don't know that to be true. That could be intentional or fraud. <clears throat> the purchaser didn't know it to be true. And the purchaser relied upon you and your truth and your obligation and your duty to care and obedience, that non-fiduciary. So they relied upon you and that person actually got harmed. All right. So that is the most grievous error. It is called fraudulent misrepresentation or just fraud. Now, there is another one called negligent misrepresentation in which you fail to exercise reasonable skill and care to ascertain the truth about a material defect or some piece of information that was germane to the deal. What, 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 what did you just say? Okay, here's what I just said. You failed to check the zoning on a piece of property that your buyer was looking at to verify that it actually could do what your buyer wanted to do. Your buyer has engaged you to find some land to build a uh, self-storage unit. You bring him a piece of land. Hey, it's two acres, dude. This is a good price. Make an offer. Yada, yada, yada. But you failed to check the zoning to make sure it could actually have storages on it. That would be negligent misrepresentation. You failed to use reasonable skill and care to ascertain the truth. You did not protect your client from getting harmed. <clears throat> there is a seller's disclosure form we use. It is a legal document in almost every state that the seller gives some form of information that is to the potential buyer. This document is known as the property disclosure. It's important for a couple different reasons for both buying a home and selling a home, but it provides a clear picture of the home and its history. Plus it allows buyers to make a more educated decision about their offer that they want to give to the seller. It is a very important document and specifically in the state of Indiana, now their purchase agreement says that if something is disclosed on the seller's disclosure, it cannot be the basis for a termination of a purchase agreement at a later date. Texas has the same rule and so does Colorado. Those I know of. 
So now it's very incumbent upon your sellers to fill this out. This was placed in the purchase agreement specifically to try and help guide a seller to be honest. Because let's look at it this way. Let's say the seller wants to lie and go, hey, don't tell anybody about the hole in the roof so they don't put it in the seller's disclosure. The buyer finds out through an inspection and the deal goes south and now everybody's out time and money. Whereas if the seller discloses this on the seller's disclosure, the buyer can no longer, in theory, use that as an excuse to get out. Dude, there's a hole in the roof. Man, I told you there was a hole in the roof before you made the offer. You should have made the offer subject to the hole in the roof. All right? So seller's disclosures are very important in the state of Texas, uh, state of Colorado, state of Indiana, has that poison pill in the purchase agreement. I'm sure there's other states that do that as well. Now, the National Association of Realtors has determined this thing that is called a stigmatized property. A stigmatized property is a property that has been psychologically impacted by an event that occurred or suspected to have occurred on the property. And it's very important that we understand that there are five kinds of stigmatized properties. There's this thing called a murder stigma. If a property, if there's someone that has been murdered or if someone that commits suicide in the house, there is criminal stigma. If the house was used as a location for the commission of a crime, there is a controlled substance stigma if the house was used in the manufacture of an illegal controlled substance. There's gang, if the house was a location or the gang participated in gang related activities. There's what they call a police action stigma. If there's a discharge of a wep policeman's weapon in the line of duty. And then the last one that I just mentioned kind of a minute ago was the reputation of a stigma like haunted houses is a house haunted there are going to be people that are going to tell you absolutely emphatically without a doubt no such thing and there are going to be people that are emphatically will tell you there are however the reputation of a house being haunted could also be a stigma i was in new orleans in the french quarter new orleans down in the French Quarter, I saw a house for sale and the writer on the for sale sign <laughs> actually said, not haunted, <laughs> cool, <laughs> not haunted. <clears throat> now here's the kicker about those disclosures or those stigmatized properties. They are not in most states required to disclose this voluntarily. California does, if there's a person that has died in the home within the last three years, that actually has to be a voluntary disclosure. Indiana does not require any voluntary disclosure. Indiana is on a list of probably about 22 or three different properties where this act is the same. Uh, Oklahoma, a lot of the Midwest, Oklahoma, Ohio, Kentucky, are not required to de voluntarily disclose a psychologically affected property. Now, here's the kicker, and this was written by an attorney, and you can tell because there ain't no way a sober person would have thought of this. If you are asked, Indiana rules, Florida rules, West Virginia rules, all state the same concept. You are not allowed to give misleading evidence that doesn't mean that you have to voluntarily acquiesce and say yes so what am i talking about let me explain it if someone says hey raymond did someone die in this property did they commit suicide now i didn't disclose that 
So I would literally say, okay, step over the chalk outline and let's talk about it. <laughs> that, that was poor taste. But you laughed. You, you got it. So here's what I'm saying. We could say at the Modulin Group, we have decided to not discuss this topic. Notice I did not give misleading information. That's what the rule says. You cannot give misleading information. I didn't give misleading information. I literally told them, we have decided we do not discuss this topic as a matter of company policy. I did not say yes, but I didn't lie. Now, if that agent, other side, says, look, we want to hear this answer, yes or no, or we're not writing an offer, my client could still say, don't disclose, okay? We have decided that we don't talk about this. You want to go look for it, you can go look for it. We are not going to confirm what you think you know. We are just allowed to not give misleading information. If the buyer doesn't ask, this has been several questions I get routinely throughout the year. If the buyer fails to ask any of these questions, and it wasn't required for us to disclose it. Once the property closes, there's very little that buyer can do. Now, if you are in a state like California and you misrepresent it, it's a whole different ball, whole different ball game. There could be legal action. If in California, I told you, if someone has died in the property within the past three years, they have to voluntarily disclose that. If they fail to, that is a disclosure issue. This is not a stigmatized property issue. That was a failure to, failure to disclose pertinent facts. So yes, there could be some liability. In our state of Indiana that I come from, there is no legal ramifications prior to the closing if the buyer never asked. That should have been something they dealt with before closing all right so those are some non-fiduciary obligations that you would owe we call that customer level service so we're going to uh refill our coffee take a five or ten minute break for those of you at home there is no five or ten minute break <laughs> take as long as you want just come back here in a minute and finish up here we go